Welcome to the Valhalla Filmcast, a show where normal guys talk about the films that they love. And here are your hosts, Bryce Thompson, Brian Hammond, and Cody Ryrie. Now get ready, because the show starts in 3, 2, 1. Welcome to the Valhalla Filmcast. I am Cody Ryrie, and I am joined by Bryce Thompson and Brian Hammond. Say hi, fellas. You stole my job. Yeah, you said you'd take control. <laughs> I know. It's okay. Hey, guys. I just wasn't, be... I just was like way thrown <laughs> off. <laughs> We're so used to you not being here. That's the thing. I know. <laughs> We've got hey, to get okay. you back it's in good to have you back. <laughs> I'll retake my control later. Okay. Well, I, can, I think I can right. hear the bags under your eyes from the late nights of the baby. But that's a good thing. We're all supposed to go through nah, that. So. I actually have a confession to make. Uh oh. Sleep's been great. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> that means it hasn't been for somebody else in your household, huh? So No. It's it's actually been not too bad. And I don't know. Depends. But we don't <laughs> want to talk about crying baby. Let's get on with the show. Let's uh, yeah, we're we're the crying what babies. Everyone's here for. Right. All right. <laughs> um well we're gonna try out a new uh show format. We're always trying new things here. At the Valhalla Filmcast. And I haven't thought of a catchy name for this one yet, so if anybody else thinks of one, let us know. But the idea behind this is we pick one genre of uh, movies. And this time we're doing science fiction. And we're going to go over from the year 2000 to 2015. So the last 15 years. And for each year, we're going to pick a movie from that genre that we at the Valhalla Filmcast can recommend to you to watch. Um, pretty simple idea. We've gone through and we've made a list of candidates. Some years there's only one candidate, so it'll be just we'll talk about why we like it and what it means. Other years there's two or three candidates, and we'll kind of battle out which one we think is the best and which one we should recommend. So we're just going to dive right into it, starting with the year 2000. And the one that we came up with for that one was uh, Pitch Black, starring Vin Diesel. And I have not seen this one, but Brian has. He was the one that... Uh, brought it up and recommended it. So, Brian, I'll let you talk real briefly about why Pitch Black is a, a good sci-fi movie to catch. Um, this is kind of um, a really um, gritty, dark uh, sci-fi that uh, is kind of right up my alley. It stars Vin Diesel, and uh, it's kind of uh, Vin Diesel before he was Vin Diesel. And so you kind of get to see uh, a glimmer of him before he's all... High and mighty, and um, too cool for the screen. And if you like Vin Diesel, I'm not trying to offend you, I promise. But um, <laughs> <laughs> he's he's good in doses. But uh, this yeah. was really a good a good film that kind of uh, uh, launched, uh, you know, a, a fairly successful uh, franchise. Uh, three films, I think. And um, so anyway, I feel kind um, of un- I feel uninformed, but. Can you give me a brief like plot synopsis? Because I really don't even know what it's about. So oh, I yeah. knew you were going to ask me that. I don't really know what it's about either. I remember them being <laughs> underground. <laughs> so I have a question. Yes, I have a question. Yes, I haven't seen this movie either. Okay, but is this this is this like the Riddick? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. That's uh-huh. it. Okay. So, yeah, because I looked it up and I was like, hey, that looks familiar. So full oh, okay. disclosure, it has been a bit since I've watched it. So I'm just going to read this right off of IMDb. It's just All a right. short little thing. A uh, commercial transport ship and its crew are marooned on a planet full of bloodthirsty creatures that only come out at, uh, to feast at night. But then they learn that a month-long eclipse is about to occur. Ooh. Doesn't yeah, that sound awesome? Cool. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we picked a good one, and I didn't even know it. So that was good. <laughs> 2000 was a tough year uh, for was. sci-fi. We were looking at all the, the available options, and a lot of them fit easier into other categories. So it, it'll get better from here on out. Rough start, but sounds like a good movie. Um, on to 2001. Uh, we had two picks from 2001. We'll have to decide which one we think is better. Uh, but the first one is AI, Artificial Intelligence, from Steven Spielberg. And the second one is Donnie Darko, which both came out that year. Uh, I'll talk about AI for a second. AI is the story of a child robot played by Haley Joel Osment. 
and he is adopted by a couple who has a child that's in a coma to kind of replace that child in a way. And it's this kind of dark um, family drama that Steven Spielberg is so good at. It contains a great performance from Haley Joel Osment. It's a fantastic looking movie. Uh, it was one that was developed a lot by Stanley Kubrick before he died and then passed along to Steven Spielberg. And you kind of see the mixture of those two styles. I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very thought-provoking. I don't want to get too much into it before we get into spoiler territory. So I personally, having seen both of these, would vote for AI. If one of you two wants to give a little background on Donnie Darko, maybe we can come to a decision. Um, okay. Uh, what do you think, Bryce? You want me to take it? Yes. <laughs> Donnie Darko? I, have not, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen Donnie Darko. Donnie Darko so. is incredible. It's it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, it's uh, directed by Richard Kelly, stars Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal, and um, who else? Help me out, Cody. <laughs> oh, uh, Rob, uh, Patrick, uh, oh, Patrick Swayze is great in it, too. Yes, yeah. uh, Drew Barrymore. And Drew Barrymore. Yep. Yeah. And uh, what it is, it, it's kind of this, um, it delves into time travel, but in a way that uh, has never been done before. Um, it's He's kind of this uh, disgruntled teenager, kind of a not really coming of age story. It's a little late for that in his years. You know, he's he's in high school. Um, but um, it, it, it delves with him and uh, time travel and uh, physics and bends that and uh, has one of the coolest uh, 80s montages. Uh, it looks like a music video, which Richard Kelly has some experience in that. So that explains that. But it's just a this kind of uh, dark, twisted tell that uh, really did not do very good at the box office, but uh, gathered steam and really developed a cult following to become a classic. And um, for all you people that, uh, you know, um, maybe fans, uh, Arrow's actually putting together the most awesome box set I've ever seen. Uh, it's UK only, but if you're region free enabled, then uh, pick it up because it, it looks incredible. The special features are awesome. So, well, um, it's a tough movie to summarize because as you were talking about is. it, I was like, "How would I summarize it?" And it's it's a really tough kind of non traditional movie. It does not have a story that's easily followed but that's kind of why it's awesome and mm-hmm. i remember when i saw this in high school i've just rewatched it uh last week so it's fresh oh. in my mind but um when i watched this in high school it's the only movie ever where we watched it and then we all stopped and looked at each other and then we just hit play again and watched it all over again twice because we just <laughs> didn't know what we'd exactly seen and it captivated us the tone of it's amazing and as an adult, going back to revisit it, uh, I'm not sure what I think, to be honest. I think it touched me deeper as a teenager because it really taps into a lot of that teenage adolescent it does. material. So yeah. I'll tell you what. I feel like um, we can give this one to Donnie Darko and we'll give uh, Spielberg a pass because he's going to come up later anyway and he can't be a hog. So really? For, I was going to concede, Cody, because you just watched we're, it. We're, so that's a pretty good <laughs> indicator. Uh, I haven't seen it for uh, probably a year and a half. So, <laughs> Well, we're, we're both in a conciliatory mood after our Tim Burton show. So the, uh, <laughs> But no, I think we should give that one to Donnie Darko. So we pitch black Donnie Darko, and then we'll move on to 2002. And for 2002, we have a Minority Report. And that is the only entry that we were able to find for that year that we thought entered this category. Um, Bryce, have you seen Minority Report? See, I'm not doing too no? good. We're so batting far. 0 for 3 here over on Bryce's corner. Well, I promise you, See, I promise you, as we get towards uh, the end of the list, a lot of these you'll have seen many times and loved. At least one of them for sure. And I bet there's several. Well, that's- well, that's, that's good. I believe you. <laughs> so, well, I'll talk about Minority Report because it is one a personal favorite of mine. Uh, this is where Spielberg shows up again. Somehow the man made AI, Minority Report, and Catch Me If You Can all in the space of two years. So I don't know how he did that, but he did. And Minority Report is the story of three uh, individuals who are able to see murders before they happen. And those images are transported to the police. It's in a pre-crime division, and Tom Cruise leads the pre-crime division. 
and they go and they arrest people before they commit the murder. They stop it from happening. And the question, of course, becomes, if you stop it from happening, does that mean that they're still guilty and they should be locked away? And are they always perfect? And it's a very film noir, very gritty, dark, action sci-fi. One of my absolute favorite Steven Spielberg movies uh, reminds me a lot of uh, Blade Runner, which is another favorite science fiction film, this cop story mixed with film noir, mixed with science fiction. Anyway, I can't say enough about it. Um, Bri- or Brian, did you want to comment on it at all before we moved on? Um, yeah, this is another one of those um, movies that just really captivate you from the beginning. Um, I like it because it's kind of a, um, a kind of a, a, a commentary on you know uh, surveillance issues and things that we really deal with uh, in today's day and, uh, day and age. And uh, so that's a cool spin to have that kind of topical, even though it is sci-fi. Um, it, it, those things are becoming a reality. Um, it's based off of a, a short story by Philip K. Dick, which if you don't know who he is, he pretty much wrote every um, you know uh, sci-fi movie that's out there, <laughs> or the story yeah. at least. Um, yeah, so anyways, it's just great. Highly recommend it, and uh, yeah, it's awesome. Okay, moving on to 2003. 2003 was the suckiest year for science fiction films in <laughs> recent history. And it's terrible. It's just awful. And I feel it's appropriate that that's when I actually began a two-year sabbatical from watching movies that year. So someone was looking out for me and decided that 2003 <laughs> would be a sucky year for movies, especially sci-fi movies. We looked through a bunch of them. And uh, the only one that we came out with in the end was uh, the second Matrix movie, Matrix Reloaded. That was the best of the bad movies that we found. Now, The Matrix Reloaded is, uh, for me at least, a very mixed bag. Uh, the first Matrix is fantastic, but it doesn't make our list because it came out in 99. So, But this one is a sequel that brings back some really interesting, awesome action beats. The plot gets a little more convoluted before it absolutely implodes in on itself. In revolution, so this is a halfway recommendation from a year that sucked it up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th- the other ones that we were we had to choose from were uh, Terminator Three, uh, Judgment Day, uh, Matrix, uh, uh, Revolutions, um, and they both came out the same year. Yeah, it just wasn't a, a great year at, at all. But um, you know, I. I feel comfortable choosing this just because the Matrix w- was so, you know, kind of groundbreaking. And this was an event. I remember going to this and looking forward to it. Um, I wasn't all that, uh, <laughs> I didn't leave the theater all that impressed, but, you know, it was an event. So um, I feel comfortable uh, calling that one out, sure. Plus, Matrix is piggybacked onto that because you have to watch the first one first. So yeah. we snuck it in there somehow. <laughs> Okay, um, moving on to 2004. This is interesting. 2004, we've picked basically the polar opposite of the big budget kind of sci-fi movies that we've been listing up until this point, except for Donnie Darko. And it's a little independent film called Primer. And I have seen this one recently, but uh, Brian, you're the one that brought this up, so I'll let you take this one. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Let's see. Um... Okay, so it, it's been a few years. I watched this when it came out, and I haven't revisited it. Um, but what I remember it, um, it's it's this. Uh, it has a sixty-eight uh, meta score. It's it's pretty well received uh, critically. Um, it's about four friends that kind of um, are inventing this thing in this garage, and it kind of turns into. Um, what we know today is is a time machine, and um, but it it has some interesting. Um, uh, different spins on time travel. Um, Cody, you take it from here. Yeah, well, I just picked it up on Netflix, not knowing what it was. It was recommended because of something else I watched. And I remember it was only like an hour and ten minutes long, so I was like, hey, I can do that. And it's really interesting because it starts off as, I don't want to say traditional, but it's a regular story about these guys building this thing in their garage. And then as the time travel is successful, then the whole thing gets so fragmented. I guess like it would if that really happened you know the first trip is pretty clear but then the second and third and fourth and fifth and on and on and on then time and space and what we know about what's going on gets so mixed up it's actually 
fairly hard to follow, but that's kind of the point. So it's a really ambitious little film uh, from you know a lot of first time performers, first time director with next to no money. But especially for the runtime and everything, I think it's definitely worth uh, checking out. It's a little interesting. Yeah, and movie. It, it it kind of has some twists and different takes on the whole uh, time travel paradox that is the you know the downfall to every time travel movie. And so it, it's definitely worth a visit. Um, this is uh, director Shane Carruth, the same one that did uh, Upstream Color in 2013, and uh, I I actually reviewed this on our podcast. Um, and uh, cannot say enough good things about that. So, yeah, definitely, he's only done two, um, two films so far. Um, so one to look look out for this director. Okay, so we're the third of the way through. Bryce, you have any comments so far? We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just want to shut you out before. I want to make sure you had a chance to talk. No, you're okay. Good. You are good. All right, 2005, this is where we have our first battle, and I don't know how this is going to turn out because I have some very strong feelings about it. I, I'm not feeling conciliatory on this one. This is uh, pretty close to, the, <laughs> close to the heart. Anyway, 2005, the two picks are Serenity by Joss Whedon and uh, V for Vendetta, uh, which was produced by the Wachowskis but not directed by them. Uh, first off, I'll take Serenity, and then I'll let Brian take V for Vendetta. Uh, Serenity is one of my it's not in my top 10 but it's definitely in my top 20 films of all time uh, it's a science fiction film that's an extension of the te- television show Firefly that was cancelled after half a season it's, uh, it's about a group of kind of smugglers and misfits on a spaceship that's going around the galaxy in a time in the future when a bunch of planets have been colonized by humans and it's how they try to avoid and kind of do combat with this overarching government organization. Anyway, I made it, I made it sound stupid. But the movie itself <laughs> is really really good. The dialogue and the characters is uh, incredible. The uh the man who wrote uh Ender's Game, uh oh what's his name? He's a Mormon Orson author Scott actually. Card. Orson Scott Card. Yeah. He's a, you know, very very famous science fiction author. Uh he's come out and said that Serenity is his favorite movie of all time. And I think that's a pretty strong endorsement from uh, one of our preeminent science fiction voices of our time. Um, I just think you need to go see it. And while you're at it, watch Firefly. It's only like 12 episodes long because it got canceled. So really, really good, groundbreaking, humanistic sci-fi that, again, is very important to me. Because when I saw it in life, and I've watched it, gosh, probably 70 times. And I still, I'd watch it again right now. So... Yeah, that's me on Serenity. 70 times. Well, I can't go up against 70 times, so um, <laughs> I'm going to graciously con- concede on this one. Um, however, uh, V for Vendetta, in case you're curious, is an excellent film about uh, you know fascist government in, in uh, Britain and uh, um, this kind of uh, rebel um, group that uh, Natalie Portman gets uh, caught up in to uh, take down this fascist government. Um, it's it's really kind of uh, has some unique um, uh, you know camera shots and different um, uh, plot you know things that take it you know it, ma- it make it's a good watch a uh, really good watch um, but I will definitely concede that to Serenity since I haven't seen it and I I no what, what? yeah. Oh, oh, Before Bryce, he speaks. Wins. he speaks. Sorry, sorry. I'll just come in there, slip on in. <laughs> See, I've actually seen B for Vendetta. Hey, all right. And, and it's really good, so it wins. Oh, he's just trying <laughs> to start default. a fight. That's all he's doing. <laughs> trying to start a fight. No, actually, so since I have, like, science fiction, as you can tell, I'm not up on my movies so i looked it up and i have one to add to 2005 i know that you guys oh, already okay. have right. your list yeah but it. i'm adding one it's it's an animated movie um it's kind of cheesy but i really liked it when i watched it so i'm throwing it in there because i haven't said anything so <laughs> okay if final fantasy uh eight advent children it's really dorky and <laughs> but it plays to my video games, and so that's always cool too. Yeah. But it's really good. Like it's really like for a anime type 
video game movie. It's really well made. It's really cool. And I think I don't know anything about Final Fantasy, like at all. I've never really played the games. And I watched it and I liked it. So there you go. But I'm going to have to vote for V for Vendetta. Trying to start a fight. Because I thought Have it was you awesome. seen Serenity? I thought it was awesome. Bryce? I think we all know the answer. <laughs> so how can to you vote for something? Hey, okay. Hey, so, Cody. Cody, I, yeah. I heard this uh, described, Firefly described as um, a friend looked it up and, and, and read it as a, we- a space western. Is that uh, true? Yes, that's very true. They, you know, have. Because that definitely has my interest uh, peaked, so. Yeah. I'm excited to I've watch heard it. That- I've heard that Firefly is like the best TV show ever made. That's what I've heard. I've only seen so. like five or six TV shows all the way through, and that would <laughs> that would easily be my favorite. Um, yeah. Again, that's one I've watched a bunch of times. The movie got me into it. I did it backwards. I saw the movie first, and then went and saw the TV show. Yeah, it's yeah. very much a they dress kind of in a, a Western fashion. Everybody has a gun on their hip. They almost even kind of speak in a Western fashion. In here's an example: in the second episode of the show, they're in a bar, and a bar fight starts, and a guy gets thrown through the front window of the saloon, like always happens. But the front window is holographic, so it's kind of this mixture of old Western and new sci-fi stuff. And there's even and this. I won't give this away because it's kind of a spoiler, and it's a really awesome point of the movie. There's even kind of Indian characters. They're called uh, Reavers. And they're these like vicious cannibals that eat people and attack settlements, and they kind of play the role that Indians used to play in the old westerns. But there's a lot more enlightenment to that uh, plot point, and it becomes a really interesting thing. So a lot of comments on western, on sci-fi, all mixed together with the best group of characters maybe ever written for a screen. Yeah, there you go. Sorry, you got me I going love again. I Nathan Fillion too, so. Um, just so you guys know, uh, Firefly is on Netflix, so if you want to binge watch that, go ahead. Uh, Serenity is not, but you can pick it up for pretty cheap on Blu-ray, so. Absolutely. Anyways. Okay, and I actually saw a Final Fantasy movie at some point in my life. I don't know if it was that one, but it was animated, I remember that. That one's really popular, I know that. And I saw it in the theater, I remember, I, and I was younger, so that... that really? That might line up. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. I was in high school when I saw it, and I saw it like right when it came out. So uh, maybe. Probably not, they're, unless they're, you they're like, ma- somehow aged fast. <laughs> <Has> there, <laughs> Benjamin has, Button here. That's, uh, <laughs> have there been several? <laughs> there's been several fantasy, Final Fantasy films, I think. Oh, yeah. And yeah well, I saw yeah, the first one, uh, whatever it was. When it came okay, out. Okay, that makes sense. All right, moving on, moving on. 2006. Um, the one we picked, and if anybody else has ones to add, that's a great idea. If you're looking up stuff right now, you can add them to this list we made earlier. Uh, the one that I picked when we talked about it was uh, Children of Men, starring Clive, o- Clive Owen and Julianne Moore, directed by Alfonso Cuaron, one of our three Mexican amigos that we talk about fairly frequently. Um Children of Men's the story of a future not too long from now in London when, for whatever reason, for the last 18 years before the movie takes place, no one has been able to get pregnant or have a baby. And so humanity is barren. And without children being raised, everybody kind of loses their minds and things collapse. And early in the film, it's found out that one woman is pregnant again, and it's the story of how he tries to protect her and her baby and get her to the right people and things that threaten them. Anyway, it's a fantastic kind of dystopian film that has – it's really famous for its long shots. It has several scenes in the film. One towards the end I think is 15 or 16 minutes long, and it's all done in one shot. And it's not a computer trick. They just really filmed it, and it's a giant battle scene for that matter. So it's – just an incredible movie. I don't. The more I say about it, the more I'll ruin it, so I don't want to get into too many spoilers. But that's one of my favorite science fiction films of all time. Michael Caine is also in it and plays a very interesting role. Um, did anybody else have anything they want to say about Children of Men or other movies from 2006 they wanted to add? I, oh, were you going to say something, Bryce? 
No, go for it. I was just going to throw out a couple other uh, movies um, that year. That's the uh, uh, same year that Darren Aronofsky's uh, The Fountain came out, um, which is probably a tough watch for uh, most of mainstream America. Um, it's kind of out there, and if you're not familiar with uh, uh, Aronofsky's work, it's it's kind of deep. It makes you think. And, so, uh, and then the last one I was going to mention was... Um, uh, Richard Kelly's sophomore film, Southland Tells, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, is not Donnie Darko. So, anyways. <laughs> so, so this list that I'm looking at, it list. have you ever seen Slither? I've only seen I pieces have, yeah. of it. Have you seen it? <laughs> oh, yes. It's, like, I don't like scary, like, horror movies, like, really at all. But my friend forced me to watch this movie, and it's probably the best thing that he's ever done in my life. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it, I, like, I don't think I could ever watch it ever again because it's so disgusting. Wow. But it's like, I don't know, it's hilarious. You have to at least watch it like once in your lifetime. But Slither. That's that's the one with uh, Jenna Fisher from The Office, right? The secretary, Pam? Because, I, uh, is she in I that? I think so. Elizabeth Banks is in it. Well, and the, yeah. the main character uh, her... is uh, Nathan Fillion, who we were just talking about from Serenity and yep. Firefly. Yeah, Firefly connection yep. there. I don't, it's just, I, I don't even know what to say about it. I'm just glad that I've seen it. That's, that's about it. <laughs> well, you're glad I you've mean, seen it I don't it think once, I could huh? recommend it, but, and the, yeah. What is I mean, it? I, the writer and yeah, director yeah. of that, James Gunn, his most recent film was Guardians of the Galaxy. Which was a much bigger movie than Slither, but I, I've heard has some similar yes. humor to it. So. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Oh yeah, definitely. But yeah, I thought I'd mention that just because I was surprised it was mentioned on here, and I have to talk about it whenever I see Slither mentioned. So. Gotcha. Cool. Moving on. Okay. Well, those are all interesting movies, but none of them are as good as Children of Men. So there we go. All right. So there you go. Children <laughs> of Men. On to 2007. <laughs> 2007, the one that we picked. Um, earlier in the day was I Am Legend starring Will Smith Uh, fascinating movie I want to tell a story about this I guess I'll say a synopsis real quick and then I'll tell my story about it but uh, I Am Legend's about it's based on an old Richard Matheson short story uh, about a man who gets involved in a in the original story it's a vampire apocalypse and in this one it's kind of a zombie kind of vampire apocalypse and he's the last man, at least we think, the last man alive, surrounded by these creatures that only come out at night. It's kind of a horror sci-fi mixture. The film itself is very well made. Um, the special effects on the creatures has not aged well. Um, but besides that, it's a very handsomely made movie. Will Smith is really good. He carries most of the movie all by himself. Uh, there's some super... For those dog lovers out there, That's a tough. it's a tough watch. I'll just say that. I don't know if that's a spoiler or not, but if... It is. <laughs> then I, I saved you from having to see one of the most heartbreaking dog things in any movie ever. Um, yeah, my story about seeing it, I went to see this um, in a theater with my brother, and he was sitting next to a lady we didn't know. Uh, she came in after. And as we are watching the film, she just, like, started weeping, and then she, like, kept grabbing onto him. And we were both married at this point, so it was a very odd experience. And it's always stuck out in my mind. I would, I'll never forget I Am Legend because <laughs> of the crazy lady that sat next to us in the theater and kept acting out and grabbing my brother. So, yeah. That's that's funny. You know, uh, fear brings makes people do weird things. I went to – we have a amusement park uh, in our area uh, called The Lagoon. Sure, we'll shout out to them. Um, anyways, I went to the uh, Halloween uh, ride and – there were these uh, uh, women behind us that, uh, yeah, she kept like grabbing me because she was so scared, and it makes for an awkward situation because it wasn't scary to me at all. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it always makes for a weird scenario. So, um, a couple other titles that came out that year: um, Stephen King's The Mist, which was a Frank Darabont ooh, uh, film. Ooh, I love me some um, Mist. That's a great movie. So, <laughs> uh, 28 weeks later, the sequel to uh, 28 Days Later, um, Michael Bay's Transformers. Woo-hoo! Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, The Invasion, Nicole Kidman. So those are a few other ones. But uh, Bryce, did uh, you have any under, comments? Un- Underdog came out as well. Oh, yeah. 
forgot about that one. I didn't. I was <laughs> going to say, I don't even know what you're talking about. I never even heard of that. It's a, <laughs> it's a Disney film. Spider-Man 3. Spider-Man 3 came oh, out. Gosh. Oh, man. Speaking and the, I uh, remember, So, like, this was, like, my first time that I, like, went to the theater, like, midnight, like, early, like, yeah, like, planned it out. <laughs> I even had to, like, I got my tickets late because my mom wasn't sure if I could go or not. And, by the way, this was in, what, 2007? So I was, like, a junior in high school. <laughs> so that's kind that of sad. <laughs> but, so, like, my mom was like, oh, yeah, I guess you can go. And after, so, yeah, sad. But uh, No, on. okay, no, 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 uh, no. You brought up Spider-Man 3. Yeah, you can't move on from no, Spider-Man no. 3. No, 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 no. I'm moving, no, no, moving on from the sad life of me. Oh, ah, okay, mom. okay, okay. <laughs> but, uh, and, like, my ticket wasn't in the same theater, and as my friends and so i was like i'm not gonna go see this movie without my friends like that's the only reason i'm going and so i had to lie and to get past so i stole some poor sucker's seat so but he's probably happy after he found out and like i remember like being so excited and then afterwards just being so sad (laughs) (laughs) i'm just like what did i do i have to go to school tomorrow what is going on yeah I went to the Friday night opening of that because Spider-Man 2 had been like an awesome experience for me and so I was super revved for Spider-Man 3. There was a guy in costume who was there and it was, you know, a full Spider-Man outfit. Everybody's freaking out. It was just like episode 1. I've had this happen to me twice now. Episode 1 and Spider-Man 3. (laughs) Then it just got quieter and quieter and quieter. And by the time we left, I remember looking over at the guy dressed as Spider-Man, and he'd like taken his mask and his like shirt part of it off, <laughs> so that he wouldn't that be as embarrassed walking out. Oh, I, t- I tell you, there was oh, groans, awesome. there was audible groans in the theater when he does his like pelvic thrusting hip dance. Yeah, that like, that is the worst uh, little. Uh, I don't know if it's a full montage, but the worst little uh, scene that I've ever seen in my life. Seriously, <laughs> horrible, horrible, horrible. Ugh. You know what? On to better things. Screw you, Spider-Man <laughs> 3. Um, but we're going to go on to 2008. Um, I'm going to take a wild guess and think that we've all seen this one. So if I'm right, Bryce, I'm going to let you talk about this one first, and we'll go on to it. But 2008, the one okay. pick for best sci-fi film that we thought of was uh, Wally by Pixar. Am I correct, Bryce? Have you seen that one? I have oh, not seen mother Wally, of Pearl. What are you? <laughs> Everybody's seen Wally. What have, what have you have done this, with I've your life? You were a senior that year. What did you have to do? You were no, I wasn't. I wasn't a senior. Uh, yet. Oh, that's even worse. Almost. Yeah. So yeah, no, uh. I wasn't. But I've seen Death Race. That was <laughs> in two thousand eight. You know, two thousand eight so. was actually a pretty big year for for sci fi, and I'm surprised that uh, um, you didn't trumpet uh, Hellboy two, uh, Cody. Uh, thing is, yeah, Hellboy two is a fantasy film in my mind. It's not a sci-fi movie. Jumper. I mean, come okay. on. Yeah. I, I, I'm i going to throw up in my uh, mouth a little here. This is terrible. JJ. I, what about, no, JJ, what about this the Incredible is Hulk? Oh, go ahead, Bryce. Incredible well, Hulk. Incredible Hulk's a superhero film. We talked about this earlier. Sure. Is this a good time to bring this up? This is a good time to bring this up. Yeah, let's bring Iron it up. We've been talking about Spider-Man. Yeah, Iron Man came out that year. Dark Knight came out that year, which is not a sci-fi movie at all. Um, no. But we are talking about how genre can be really... Um, promiscuous you know it really mixes one with another and every almost every Dark Knight's an exception but a lot of comic book movies really if you looked at them straight on could be sci-fi movies you know The Incredible Hulk's a great example actually it's a scientist who you know experiments with things and it does impossible stuff to his body and that's that sounds like a science fiction film but the only reason we decided to exclude comic book films is we were thinking about doing that for a future list. But I think it's a good point to bring up that these genres are not clearly defined, especially sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. But yeah, I think that just looking at this list that I have, Wally's probably the best one that came out. You do have The Happening, though. <laughs> Yeah, that's already on uh, Shyamalan's decline, so we won't talk about so. that one. However, J.J. Uh, Abrams' Cloverfield came out um, to mixed, yes. to mixed, uh, you know. I didn't. I don't really know what to think of Cloverfield. I think I like it, but I'm not sure. I do. I'll throw my voice in there. I think I enjoyed it. Just 
Because it's like the first time that you see like the like through the camera lens, uh, right? Uh, like, through Blair Witch like, beat it by several years. Oh, but, but come on, Blair Witch, really? <laughs> I mean, I was so excited to be scared to death, and then I just laughed. The whole we time. lost the map. We lost the map. Yeah. The <laughs> oh my, like, <laughs> like come on. But anyways. Well, and I will make a so, slight correction. Um, J.J. Abrams produced Cloverfield, but Matt Reeves directed it. And the only reason I make yeah. that correction is because Matt Reeves is one of my most exciting up-and-coming uh, filmmakers. Only three films to his credit right now, but they are Cloverfield, uh, Let Me In, and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. So he has an amazing track record yeah. in my book so far. And quick fact... Before we get back to what we're actually talking about, J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves, childhood <laughs> friends, and they were both picked to restore Steven Spielberg's uh, films he made when he was a kid, when they were kids, and it was a big Time Magazine thing. And then later on, they became actual big-time film directors. So there you go. A little trivia for you. Oh, Wally. We never talked about Wally. Well, if you haven't seen Wally either, shame on you. I just like Bryce. So I'm not going to tell you what it's about because you should go watch it. There's no reason not to. Suck on that. Yeah. All right, 2009. We're moving on. Um, we got four possibles in 2009, so at least I'm going to talk about my two favorites, and then I'll let uh, everybody else pitch in. My two favorites from that year, my number one favorite is Moon by Duncan Jones. Uh, it's, it's got Sam Rockwell in it. It's the story he's up on the moon, <laughs> and he's doing like mining and things like that, and he's all by himself. Except for the computer he talks to, which is voiced by Kevin Spacey. And again, it's one of those, I don't want to give too much away, but it's a very interesting, thoughtful, kind of mystery science fiction plot. Uh, Yeah, just go watch it. You'll do yourself a favor. It's really good. Uh, My second pick from that year is the reboot of Star Trek by J.J. Abrams, who we just talked about. Uh, Just a great cast of actors. They did a fantastic job of rebooting that series and giving it Uh, A new edge, but also being very faithful to the things that made the original Star Trek great. Now we're three movies into that series, and the last one was fantastic, too. So the other one I had on my list, which I don't really feel like talking about, was uh, Avatar. Um, Yeah, best, highest grossing movie of all time, Blue People, yada yada. So what else did you all have for 2009? I say... I'm negating Avatar. <laughs> I wish that you didn't even say that. Because, I mean, let's be honest. Does anybody even know, like, what Avatar is anymore? I. It's not, it's not, it's not necessarily badly made, I don't think. I mean... No. No, it's not badly made. It's just no one's ever going to watch it's just, it yet. It's very derivative in its storyline and its characters. I think the reason it was so revolutionary is because of the technology behind it. But, you know, on the I'll small agree. screen, it doesn't, it doesn't have a lot... To offer, although I do like, um, I can't remember the actor's name. He was just on Don't Breathe as the bad guy, but he's one of the bad guys in Avatar as well. And his call sign is Papa Dragon, which I always think is hilarious. I don't know why that always gets me laughing. <laughs> I no, no, that's inappropriate for the podcast. But there's a funny joke behind that that I'm not going to tell. Anyway, what else we got in 2009? Nice. Uh, uh, the one that I liked. There's a t- bunch in 2009, actually. Um, but the one that I just want to mention, because I think that there's been some hate on it in the Bahal world, but District 9, mm. Mm. I en- quite enjoy District 9, actually. Um, I've heard the rumor. I've actually never confirmed this rumor or not, but it, I've heard that it was supposed to be a Halo movie, so that piqued my interest, of course. But then... Also, just watching it, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was a interesting story, kind of like – it's kind of like a racial movie in a way, but then it's not, and it's really weird. But I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a good movie. Um, I'm going to throw so. my hat into the ring with uh, um, Mr. Nobody. Uh, this is a film by um, Jaco van Dormel. Um He's a Belgian uh, director. Uh, this stars Jared, Le- uh, Jared Leto, uh, Sarah Pauly, and D- Diane Kruger. Um, 
this movie blew me away when I watched it. I immediately went out, uh, bought the director's cut. Uh, it was on Netflix. This is one of my Netflix discoveries, and I have talked about it a little bit before, but um, it's just so creative. Um, again, we've kind of got, um, you know, it, it tells a very, uh, you know, non-linear um, narrative. Um, it's about this boy who's kind of standing on the station platform, and he kind of you know, it follows two path lines, whether he chooses his parents or, uh, uh, getting a divorce, uh, whether he chooses his mom or chooses his, uh, uh, dad to go live with and, uh, tons of other little sub, um, you know, little stories that take off from there. Um, it's in the future, 2092. He's the last man on earth. Um, uh, so, it, you know, it's kind of goes back and forth from him as a kid, um, and also him is uh, the last man on earth. Um, let me clarify this. Oh, I'm getting into a mess here. I'm sorry, guys. But uh, um, anyways, Jared Leto character, uh, they've they've come up with a way to uh, make men essentially immortal, right? Um, using uh, biogenics or whatever. Um, so uh, Jared Leto is essentially the last mortal man alive. Let me clarify that. And... Um, uh, anyways, it just talks about uh, or, or takes those different uh, narratives and, and plays it out. And it's just a fascinating, um, very um, difficult uh, to follow necessarily. Uh, multiple viewings are uh, definitely recommended on this, but it's incredible. And uh, that that is definitely my pick uh, um, for that year for sure. So, Okay, all right, going back to... I have not seen Mr. Nobody, although I am very intrigued now. And uh, Jared Leto, despite anything attached to Suicide Squad, is still an actor I would love to watch in almost anything. Um, going back to District 9, I have only seen the film once, and for some reason it just didn't click with me yeah. on the first viewing. But it's fair to say that many m movies didn't click with me on the first viewing, but then I, I loved them on second or third viewings. And so often, like Bryce, or not Bryce, yeah, the only <laughs> different names. Often, like Brian, um, I will buy a movie even though I don't really want it. And that happened with District 9. So I own District 9, even though I've only seen it once and didn't particularly like it. So now I can rewatch it when the bug strikes me. Um, I actually enjoyed um, this filmmaker, I don't remember his name, but his follow up uh, oh, with Matt uh, Dan's Blood Camp. Uh, Elysium. Blood Camp, right? I enjoyed. Blood, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed uh, Elysium a lot more than I did District 9, which was funny because it seemed like everybody else was the other way around. But, uh, no, I, I really liked Elysium. That's another shout-out. I don't remember what year that came out in, but we've missed that. And I would like to point out really quick, because you were talking about Mr. Nobody, and it brought a movie to mind that may have been a a gross oversight, maybe one of the biggest oversights we've ever made on the Valhalla Filmcast. But I don't know what year it came out in, but we did not mention Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yeah, that's weird because I don't really... It's arguably maybe the best science fiction yeah, film so of the last 15 years. I really don't years. think of that as uh, science fiction, but it, it can firmly be placed in that. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. I, would, I mean, I think it is, um, anyways. Just so you know, you know they, they list all the genres on IMDb um, underneath the title. It says drama, fantasy, romance. Um, See, for so, me, like the, the line between fantasy and sci-fi is technology and futuristic whatever. And in that movie, they get into people's minds using yeah. technology. So that's why I'd put it more in that. But okay, yeah. fair enough. I think it's fair. No, I think that's fair to, to call that a sci-fi. And yeah, uh, definitely watch that. We've already talked about it, though, too. So Yeah, well, that's one I, Hope. again, I'll have a shout out to you all for recommending. I had not seen it before, and now it's become a favorite film so anyway on to the next year we have uh 2010 and my pick from 2010 was inception by christopher nolan starting leonardo dicaprio uh if you've not seen this this is about uh people who go into people's minds when they're asleep and in their dream world they're able to implant suggestions or steal information it's kind of an action sci-fi mind-blowing film uh it's been in the culture for a long time now so i'm imagining most of you have seen it anyway one of one of christopher nolan's best if not his best movie to date and yeah it's great what else we got from 2010 
Oh, there's a bunch that kind of came out. You have Mega Mind. Um, I guess that counts. That's kind of that's kind of superhero, but yes, <laughs> kind okay. of Despicable, Despicable Me. That's kind of opposite. Yeah, yeah. Of what you're talking about, uh, Hot Tub Time Machine. <laughs> technically, yes. Uh, technically, yeah. Technically, <laughs> but yeah. Um, Resident Evil Afterlife. But I'll I'll throw lots. one out there. Uh, the Book of Eli. Um, yeah, oh yes, with, it's a good uh, movie. Denzel, yeah. Denzel Washington. Yeah, it's a, a really good one. Uh, the Hughes brothers directed that one, and it's it's kind of a, a post apocalyptic, um, you know, um, bad a movie <laughs> with uh, Denzel Washington doing what he does best, and that's uh, you know kicking some can out there. So um, uh, also stars Gary Oldman, uh, Oldman, sorry, which um, you know he does a, a good job in that. Um, what do you guys want to add to that? It's a. I think. Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. Brian. Or Bryce. Dang it! You all need different names. Go ahead, Bryce. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say that I think Inception definitely takes 2010 without any question. Sure. Really. I mean, there's lots of good movies, but Inception definitely wins. Yeah. So I, mean, I hesitated qu- even mentioning any others in that year just because of Inception. <laughs> But uh, we right. wanted to, th- you know, we're throw good. some out yeah. there. I have a question. I have a question. So this is for Bryce. Yes. Okay, got yes. it. Um, do you remember seeing this in the theater when it came out? No. No? I I was in a uh, place in my life when I couldn't watch movies. <laughs> You're sabbatical? Yes. <laughs> so, so I was actually in church. And someone talked about this movie in church. Oh wow! That's how big it was. Yeah, I. So, hey, it's a religious experience. I, I, I'm fine with that. <laughs> like, so I couldn't watch it, but I heard lots about it. So all right, I'm gonna get yeah, into spoilers I, just for a second. So if you want to fast forward, but it's 2010. You had six years. Get on it anyway. Um, the end of the film right. when he spins the top to see if he's still awake or not. And you know that the top spins for forever and forever and forever, and then it looks like it's maybe going to topple over, and then the movie ends before you yes, get an answer to that question. question. I was in the big theater question. watching that for the first time, and uh, when that happened, when the movie ended without showing you what really was going on, there was this like audible groan, and then there was a laugh that came afterwards because it was like this: "No, you're not going to yeah. show us." And then everybody was like, "Oh, he got us," you know. And then what? I think yeah. what happened is what he wanted to have happen. Everybody got up and started talking to whoever was next to them, you know. And there was like, well, "What do you think?" Well, I don't know. I saw this. What? Did I, I saw this earlier. This happened here, and it's one of the most interesting uh, discussion-inducing movies that's probably ever been made. It, it is definitely the yeah. biggest cliffhanger of any movie I can think of, you know. And if you are a faithful Valhalla listener, we talk about this in uh, early show. This question, this... Oh, whether or not the top keeps spinning? Question. It's the question of the ages. I think I say, like, I think that's the question of the ages. If the top like, falls on it... a counter, does anyone really see it? No. <laughs> right. That's right. Okay. Very good. Anyway. Okay, moving on. Moving on. 2011. Uh, my pick for 2011, it was a hard call because there's a lot of good movies that year, was Source oh, Code. And Source Code was uh, another time travel adventure starring Jake Gyllenhaal. My buddy Jake, he's got. I got a soft spot for my buddy Jake, and it's about he's a, uh, uh, a helicopter pilot in the army, but he's all of a sudden invi- invi- like involved in this computer program that sends him back in time, but only for eight minutes in a stretch. And so he has these eight minute stretches of time to try and figure out who blew up a train on the way to Chicago. And so he goes and relives this eight minutes over and over and over again as he's trying to figure out this mystery. Really, really smart movie, really well written, really well made, fantastic performances, and it was my number one pick in 2011. Quick shout out to Rise of the Planet of the Apes, which was just beneath it, because uh, it's and we're gonna get back into Planet of the Apes in future shows, but uh, a <laughs> uh, a, f- a fantastic movie, great performance by Andy Serkis, uh, fantastic use of technology. Yeah, those are mine. What y'all got? I've uh, you gotta you gotta throw in Super Eight. Yeah. Oh, suck. Can I, can I just oh, kind yeah. of uh, machine gun some of these? Uh, this is arguably the best uh, year for sci-fi film. Seriously, 
Um, yeah. We got Adjustment Bureau, uh, Super 8, uh, Green Lantern, X-Men, uh, First Class, Transformers, Limitless, Cowboys and Aliens, Captain America, Paul, Battle Los Angeles, In Time, Real Still, Apollo 18, uh, Darkest Hour, I Am 4, Thor, The Thing, uh, Priest, Mars Needs Mom, and my personal favorite, uh, Lars Van, Von Trier, Melancholia. So, anyways... That's where we'll leave it. That would be your favorite. <laughs> yeah, me. there's a ton. Yeah, it's great. I think, year. Great year. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen Source Code myself, but I think Super Eight is fantastic. It is. And so that's okay, okay. I want to say this. I was making this list without the aid of technology. So mm-hmm. first off, be impressed. Second off, <laughs> um, if I had known that. I would have to give it to Super 8 myself. I did not know that that was the year. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we can make yeah, a, a ruling on that. I agree with that. Are we all in agreement? Super 8. That's yes. It. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on. 2012. 2012. My pick for that one is Looper. Uh, yes. Ryan Johnson, written and directed, uh, starring Bruce Willis. Um and young Bruce Willis. <laughs> Again, without the aid of a computer. Anyway, um... And Emily Blunt, uh, what's his what's his bucket's name? The young Bruce Willis uh, in that Joseph Gordon Levitt. Thank you very much. Uh, time travel story: the mob can send people back in time, and then as soon as they get back in time, they're hooded and they're bound. And there's these guys called Loopers who just shoot them dead the second they get back, and then dispose of the body. And the reason they do that is because in the future, tagging techniques for bodies are so advanced that you can't kill somebody and disappear the body. It's impossible. But you can send them back in time and have them killed there. Uh, and then what happens is at a certain point, they send you back yourself and you kill yourself. And you take care of the body. And that's when you get a huge golden payday. And then you know for the next, I think it's 50 years, I want to say. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, it's really Excellent. good. Groundbreaking. I would say that it's probably the best one. I mean, you have the Hunger Games, which is pretty big. That's interesting. But hmm. still, Looper beats it. And then one that I never saw but was told that it's life-changing is Cloud Atlas. Never saw it. Heard it was amazing. Well, it does, my, it it does my heart good well, to Looper hear you say that because I that is, again, Looper Del Toro. Well. Absolutely. Who is? All right. 2003? Or 2013, not three. There's a one there. Uh, you have Despicable Me too. Yes. Um, um, this was another good, another good year. Um, so we have uh, Elysium that we talked about, the Blow Camp film, uh, uh, Pacific Rim which I think Cody will talk about. Um, Star Trek Into Darkness, Ender's Game, uh, Man of Steel, Oblivion with Tom Cruise, um, and uh, World War Z. Uh, see, see. Yeah, I think the for me the best one would have to be Pacific Rim. I thought, I thought it's just so, so good. I really liked it. I thought the monsters were cool. I thought the robots were cool. Uh, yeah, that's mine. That's my favorite. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, and I mean, I I hate to say it, but that does play into the fact. I mean, Del Toro is amazing, but I did I actually I did like I liked it a lot. I thought it was really good. So I lost y'all for just a second there, technology issue. But I am yeah, back. It got a little awkward. We, we got you covered. <laughs> but it's okay. it, it was a little, a little uh, awkward, but we got. We him. didn't know what happened. <laughs> did we good. move on to 2013? Is that what we were talking about here? Yes. yes. Yep. Did we mention Snowpiercer? Um, no, no, I was saving that well, and Gravity uh, till you got back. Uh, th- this is a tie for me between these two, with um, probably Snowpiercer peeking out just barely for me. So. Anyways, yeah, what do you think, Cody? That's mine too. I put them both down. Um, Gravity is one of the most interesting uh, movies. A lot of really interesting symbolism. The performances are great. The way it's filmed, you know, uh, the way reflections are used and whatever, just fantastic. And some of the dialogue is really stupid. 
So, <laughs> I had to. I'm sorry. It just watching the beginning of the film when the NASA astronauts are talking to each other is like nails on a chalkboard. It is some of the worst dialogue ever written for a movie. And hey, I can't judge him. I mean, the guy who wrote it is from Mexico, so second sure. language and all that. And, yeah. and you know, maybe NASA I, astronauts do talk like that. And who knows? <laughs> but I will say that this is one of the few films that I actually enjoyed, or or think it's warranted to have a, a viewing in 3D. Uh, this mm. really. Um, lends itself to the 3D format because um, you're in space and things are, you know, just kind of free floating. And so they really utilized that technology and it impressed me. I don't get impressed very easily with 3D at all in the theater. So um, I was I was pleased with that one. Okay, well, Snowpiercer, the reason that it edges out over my list is because I don't feel like it has any fatal flaws like the gravity does. It's not a fatal flaw. I mean, it's still a very fantastic... <laughs> It's a fantastic movie. Don't get me wrong. But um, Snowpiercer, so we haven't talked about it. Uh, the world's ended. It's all frozen over. There's one train that carries, basically it's like an arc that carries humanity and other stuff on it. And they just drive around the world. And in the front of the train are the super rich. And in the back of the train are the really poor. And uh, Chris Evans, Captain America himself, leads a revolt from the back of the train to the front of the train. And it's one of the most uh, visually interesting, a lot of political commentary. Uh, it's also got some incredible action scenes. There's said one where they go up against a bunch of uh, guys with axes, and they take this poisonous fish and they like get its blood all over the axes, so that anytime anybody gets cut, they'll get poisoned too. It's crazy stuff like that. It's a uh, a great yeah. great movie, and that's one that, that gets my vote on 2013. Yeah, regardless of the major, you know, the whole premise of the movie seems a little, you know, kind of ridiculous. And you, you can kind of shoot the whole plot down really easily. However, um, it what it makes, what it loses in plot, it sure makes up for in, you know, in the action, the style, and just the, the commentary on, you know, the, the politics, the class that you said. Um, some really interesting, um, just some good drama that really gets you behind the, the revolt and uh, excellent um, uh, portrayal of the rich by John Hurt. So it's just a good film. So I stumbled okay. upon that one on Netflix, and I, I love when you find those gems. Just, you know, you stumble upon it, and you're like, holy cow. So... Okay. All right. Moving on to 2014. I'm just going to name my pick, and there's a lot more in 2014. I'll let you all have the leavings, the leftovers. Um, <laughs> my uh, my number one pick from 2014 is Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt, uh, a movie that unfortunately didn't do that well in the box office, is already uh, gaining a cult following because it's so freaking awesome. It is basically Groundhog Day with uh, giant alien battles. And so I don't understand why everybody in the world didn't go see this because Tom Cruise plays this character and aliens have invaded the earth and this is the last battle, you know, their last chance to hold them back. It's very World War II, you know, and they go in with these giant mech suits to try and stop these aliens and Tom Cruise is not a soldier per se. He's more of a public relations officer and he insults and tries to blackmail a general, which gets him put in with the first wave on the beach against these aliens and he's never fought anywhere before and early on this is very early in the movie and they spoiled it in the in the uh, marketing campaign so I'm going to not spoil as much as they did in the marketing campaign but early early in the film he dies and then wakes up that morning again and it starts off at this kind of groundhog day over and over and over one of the most exciting well thought out and funniest so freaking hilarious. I watched this with my family. People were like in tears. They were laughing so hard. So, <laughs> yeah, I can't recommend it enough, especially since nobody hardly saw it in the theater. Do yourself a favor. Pick this one up. Okay, go. Yeah, it was excellent. <laughs> there. Yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> uh, there's a t but ton. I mean, we'll take too long if we talk about them all, but... Big Hero 6, I liked that. I thought it was a good little cartoon animated movie. It was good. Uh, he had the another Hunger Games. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy kind of superhero, but it 
fits more into the sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, RoboCop, um, Transformers, Age of Extinction. The, the elephant in the there's, room, the, the big one I didn't mention. Yeah, there's was two. In, Inter, Interstellar was the big one I was going to say. but Yeah, Interstellar. Yep, that's, yeah, you have that in that's Dawn big. of the Planet of the Apes. Um, which oh, yes. I, th- I thought yes. uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes was a necessary uh, step, you know, for character development and to set the whole thing up. But Dawn of the Planet of the Apes was just an incredible uh, movie and a feat of uh, technology between, you know, with the, the whole circus thing. <laughs> the whole circus, so, that sounds weird. The whole and, Andy circus uh, thing. You didn't feel like Andy Circus was hiding behind dots? <laughs> that doesn't sound like hey. something you would have said at some point in your life in an email to me? Um, anyway, um, yeah, I probably did say that. No, I know exactly <laughs> for sure that we'll, I said that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a future show. <laughs> Different show. Uh, <laughs> All right. Sorry. 2015, probably my favorite year. Anyways. <laughs> this is a Titan battle in 2015. Yes, it because is. There's a lot. Of good the, the two big contenders that I confront was Mad Max Fury Road and Ex Machina. Like, yep, those are mine. I don't know yeah. how you pick one. They're both up for a bunch of Oscars. They're both basically revolutionary in their genre. And uh, I still pick Mad Max. But, yeah, I don't know. See, I pick Mad Max because it's so special to me. But Ex Machina is definitely contender yeah. in this battle. I mean... Alicia Vikander totally like blew my mind and I can definitely tell you know why she's just kind of like blown up yeah. and just become awesome because of this movie because she does so good and all the characters when they're trying to be creepos they fit their characters perfectly <laughs> I mean like the guy is so weird yeah. and and um I, I don't know his name uh the redheaded dude um, oh, um, whatever his name is—is uh, is it Gleason? Or? Don Hall Gleason, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's so good in it too, because you're like you're like the good guy, but then you're kind of like weird, but then you're good, and he makes you—they all make you go through all these emotions. Like I remember, I watched it alone, and I was like really kind of like it freaked me out, <laughs> and like it was so good. I was like it freaked me out for a couple days. I was kind of like. Yeah, it's really good, really good. But Mad Max definitely. I mean, yeah, 100%. I think that's where that's our namesake. Uh, we probably got to go with that one. But I want to throw a shout out to um, The Martian that came out that yes. year as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we can't also we can't Star, Wars. About that. Yeah, Star, Star Wars. Yeah, Star Wars. Came out the, too. the return mm. of the franchise that uh, did it justice. So, yeah, yeah, great, great, good year. Well, okay, I want to end this. By talking about this year and what science fiction films we are looking forward to uh, before the year comes out. Because there hasn't been a whole lot yet, but there are some really exciting ones coming up. I wanted to talk about uh, Arrival. We've talked about this a little bit in our weekly updates. Um, New movie by the Sicario filmmaker. Uh, Delves into science fiction. Seems like a very Close Encounters kind of thoughtful uh, alien sci-fi movie. Looks very interesting. Um, a new trailer came out this last week for another sci-fi film called Passengers. Ah. And uh, that's got uh, Chris Pratt in it and... Uh, Jennifer uh, Lawrence. J-Law, yeah. <laughs> 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 and uh, they uh, they play a, a couple that's woken up on this sleeper ship that's going way out in the universe. And they're woken up, just those two, on this huge ship and they wake up 90 years too early before they get to where they're supposed to go. And the rest of it seemed like it's kind of a mystery in the trailer. So great actors, an interesting premise. I think that looks interesting. And then, of course, again, for now and for the foreseeable future, we're going to have a Star Wars movie every year, and we have Rogue One coming out in December, which is the story of the people who stole the original Death Star plans. So those are the ones that caught my eye for this next year. I don't know if any other ones caught your all eyes. Your all's eyes. My, I think I have the same list as you. Those ones look really exciting. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you consider. I don't think you really consider Assassin's Creed. You kind of can in a way, but not not really. But yeah, I think I you could. One. I mean, from the trailer because they use like kind a of. DNA technology thing to send him back in time, kind of. 
Yeah, move. it's kind of sci-fi-ish, ish, you know. But yeah, that would be the only one that I would add, um, if you want. But okay, Brian, you got any to add? Uh, Passengers was mine uh, with okay. Chris Pratt. I was excited for that. So yeah, that looks yeah, really good. Actually, I was just kind of looking. They look like they're going to work really well yeah. together, which is cool. I like them both a lot. Okay. Yeah. But, well, Bryce, since I stole the beginning of the show, why don't I hand it back over, pass the baton back for the end? There you go. Welcome back. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been the Ball Hall Filmcast. I'm Bryce Thompson. I'm Brian Hammond. And I'm Cody Rari. And we'll talk to you next time. The following views, opinions, and commentary are the sole property of the Valhalla Filmcast. Any unauthorized reproduction without prior consent is prohibited. Any incidental music, audio clips, or film trailers are used for the sole purpose of film criticism and commentary, as allowed under the Fair Use Act.